Welcome everyone to our World Microbiome Day celebration. Thank you all for joining from wherever you are um, in the world. Um, tomorrow marks the third World Microbiome Day. This is an initiative from APC Microbiome Institute in Ireland, inviting all microbiome researchers around the world. Welcome everyone ourselves to our World Microbiome our world Day public. celebration. Thank awareness. you all for joining Vibrant. from wherever you are um, world in the world. Um, tomorrow marks the third do, World Microbiome Day. This is an initiative from APC Microbiome Institute here in Ireland, inviting all microbiome researchers around the world. To Welcome everyone ourselves to our World Microbiome world Day public. celebration. Thank awareness. you all for joining Vibrant. from wherever you are um, in the world. Tomorrow marks the third World Microbiome Day. This is an initiative from APC Microbiome Institute here in Ireland, inviting all microbiome researchers around the world to welcome everyone ourselves to our World Microbiome Day celebration. Thank you all for joining from wherever you are um, in the world. Um, tomorrow marks the third World Microbiome Day. This is an initiative from APC Microbiome Institute here in Ireland, inviting all microbiome researchers around the world to welcome everyone ourselves to our World Microbiome Day celebration. Thank you all for joining from wherever, wherever you are um, in the world. Um, world. Um, tomorrow marks the third World Microbiome Day. This is an initiative from APC Microbiome Institute here in Ireland, inviting all microbiome researchers around the world to welcome everyone. Can you hear me right now? Yes? Okay. So let me introduce myself again. Sorry for this. <laughs> My name is Anthimo Isidou and I'll be your host for today. I'm a third year PhD student here in Cambridge and I work on tissue engineering of tools in the lab that will help us study the human gut microbiome. Through my work, it has become clear to me that we live in a microbial world. Uh, our body is really an ecosystem. And since each of us carries around an incredible diversity of all kinds of microbes, we really need to study this, this world, we really need to preserve and uh, understand this, uh, this world and its diversity. This year on World Microbiome Day, we celebrate diversity and its reflections on our lives. And I see this as, first of all, diversity of microbiomes for better host health. Each of us carries a different um, collection of microbes and we need to take care of them to stay healthy. It also diverts diversity of diets uh, to make sure that we um, preserve this diverse microbiome. It reflects diversity in the research field for more robust knowledge, but it also reflects diversity of our research community for more social equity. We, we're all in this together, right? So today I have invited four speakers each with different backgrounds and different roles in their fields, and they will help us explore the world of microbes and celebrate our relationship with them in the various facets of our lives. We will start with um, Anne's talk focusing on human gut microbiome, and we will hand the virtual floor to Giles, who will explain how our brain controls food intake. For the second hour, we will travel to Copenhagen and meet David for a live fermentation experiment. And finally, we will travel a bit further and go to Zagreb, to Liliana and Vertko, who have prepared a surprise for us. Also here with me are Roisin Owens and Liliana Fruk, of course. And behind the scenes, I have Ellie, who's helping me moderate this call. Before um, we start, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, the chat on YouTube is uh, open, so you can post your questions or if anyone is joining from Zoom, you can post your questions on the Q&A box. Each uh, speaker will be able to see your questions and then reply at the end uh, of their talk. So let's start. Okay, so it's my very great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Giles Yeo. I should, by the way, say that my name is Roshi Owens and I'm Anthe's very proud PhD supervisor. This event has been all of her doing and I had little to do with it except to just provide my full support. So um, Dr. Giles Yeo is a Principal Research Associate at the Wellcome MRC Institute of Metabolic Science. He is a geneticist with over 20 years of experience studying obesity and brain control of food intake. 
Um, you may also know him as a BBC presenter for BBC uh, Horizon and Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, uh, programs such as Why Are We Getting So Fat and Clean Eating uh, the Dirty Truth. If like me, you've read his book, <laughs> um, you'll see that he has some very sensible advice on um, avoiding fad diets. Uh, his research focuses on understanding how pathways differ between lean and obese people and the influence of genes in our feeding behavior. And I think today he's gonna to tell us about how the brain controls our food intake. Over to you, Giles. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Now, uh, do I share screen directly from here or do we have to unshare the screen first? Um, ah, thank you. Okay, so let me just go to here. All right. Uh, is this fine? Um, yeah, guys, this is good. All right. Um, hello, folks. Um, thank you very much for, for being here. Now, I know you guys are thinking, I thought we were here to do microbiome. Why is this guy going to talk about the brain control of food intake? And it is true. I'm not a microbiome person at all. Um, but I will, I will come to it at the end to find out, to let you guys know, or at least uh, about why this is, why what uh, I do is actually relevant um, to, to today's topic. Um, and so I'm here to talk about, let me just minimize this so I can see the whole um, screen. And I'm here to talk about really the brain control of food intake. And I've got a rather cryptic title. Um, can an old dog teach us new tricks? And, um, and th there are two dogs within this narrative, you'll, you'll see, uh, um, and I'll point them both out. One of them is actually um, even a real dog, and the other one is an allegorical dog, and I'll point them both out as we, as we actually um, go along. So I'm a geneticist by trade, and I think uh, being a geneticist is a perfectly upstanding thing to do. You know, my mother-in-law still speaks to me, so these are all fabulous things. But when people ask what I study, what trait I study, because a lot of geneticists use genetics as a tool rather than being particularly nerd. And I am a nerd by the right definition. I guess we're all nerds here. And I do love, um, I do love genetics, but I do use it as a tool. And so when people ask me, oh, what, what traits I study? And I say body weight, of which obesity just happens to be one end of the spectrum of body weight. Immediately, I become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving um, overweight people, people uh, living with obesity, terms I don't use in any pejorative fashion whatsoever, an excuse, which I always think is a slightly interesting philosophical take on, on things. Because if I was studying the genetics of heart disease, the genetics of uh, cancer, the genetics of rheumatoid arthritis, would I suddenly be giving those people an excuse? I'd like to think not, right? I'd like to think that I, I'm just you know, trying to understand the system, trying to understand the pathways. Yet when we talk about body weight, I am the bad person. And this is the reason why, okay? So I think uh, most of you would have seen this scales of justice, uh, energy balance uh, 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 thing in, in some form or the other. And, and this is otherwise known as the first law of thermodynamics, right? So you can't uh, magic energy from, from, from anywhere and you can't magic the energy away. So <clears throat> our body weight, our energy, uh, our body weight is part of the energy balance equation in which that in order to gain weight, you have to eat more than you burn. And in order to, therefore, in order to lose weight, you have to burn more than you eat. There we go. It's, it's, it's physics. Okay. Um, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, eat less and, and move more. Are you serious? Is this why we're here on a, on a Friday afternoon when it's 30 degrees outside here in the UK at least listening to this guy bang on? Well, listen, that's because it's true. Okay, it is physics. It's a fundamental law. We can't actually get, get around that. Um, but here's the, the, the issue. This is the how, okay? F physics is how we get to the body weight we get or how we gain weight or how we lose weight. The more interesting question to ask is why? Why do people behave so differently around food? Why do some people appear to be more efficient than others when they actually, when they actually um, eat and actually move? And that is where the complexities lie. So while the how is in the physics, how you get to the physics is the why. Okay, Why do some people end up eating more, therefore making them small, medium, or large in this current environment that we actually, that we actually live in? And whenever we talk about... Um, variation. We have to talk about genetic variation, um, clearly, because our, our genes, after all, play a big role in influencing the biology that we, um, um, you know, that we project, that we actually um, show. 
and uh, and a large part of the a large part of our understanding with regards to the genetics of um, food intake and body weight comes from twin studies. So very, very briefly, I'll just praise twi twin studies so we're all on the, same, on the same level. So why twins? Well, we have clearly identical twins and identical twins are um, genetic clones of each other in, in, in effect. Okay, they share all their genes and you clearly have um, some monozygotic twins and you clearly have non-identical twins, okay? Fraternal twins, dizygotic twins who would share as much genetic material as you would with your own siblings or for that matter, your parents, 50%. So you could take any given trait and ask the question, well, what happens when um, someone shares all their genes versus what happens when you share 50% of their genes and work out what we call heritability, okay? So the percentage of a given trait that's going to be down to your genes uh, uh, and the role that the environment would actually play. I'll give a couple of examples about how this is relevant. So if I had hair, mm -hmm, uh, my hair would be black. And now hair color is a very powerfully genetically influenced trait with very little environmental impact. Bleach does not count on your hair, people. Okay, so your natural, your natural, natural hair color. Let, let's give another example, freckles. Okay, now freckles are clearly also going to be genetically influenced, but whether or not they appear, how many appear would entirely depend on whether or not you like to wear t-shirts. Do I like to stand in the sun? So there we have the, uh, uh, an example of a powerful um, um, genetic trait with an equally powerful environmental influence. Now, if you do that, if you do those maths, then actually the heritability of body weight is calculated to be around 70%, which is high, I think. And many people find it surprising how high that is. Now, just to give you some perspective, um, the heritability of height um, is 85%. So now clearly it's not as high as height, but it's pretty high, um, it's pretty high nonetheless. So now the first, then people begin to use genetics, I guess, as a tool. And the first uh, molecular handle that we actually had about a pathway, which was informed by genetics that actually influenced food intake, came from the, from the identification of this, of this mouse over here, um, who this one on the right-hand side, who is, as you can see, has the you know, geometry of a tennis ball, but except it is brown and got whiskers and a tail and some paws, okay? So now this mouse is a naturally occurring mouse who ended up, who has a mutation in a gene called leptin, Okay, and it was discovered um, in the Jackson Labs in Maine in the in the fifties. Uh, but it wasn't until 1994 by a group of Jeffrey Friedman at the Rock at the Rockefeller University in New York that they cloned the gene, the mutated gene responsible for the phenotype. And this mouse has a mutation in the gene called leptin. Now leptin, and I'll spend um, um, pretty much most of the of the rest of the talk discussing uh, the signaling pathway of leptin. Um, so what is leptin? Well, le leptin is a fat. Hormone. It's produced from fat. The more fat you have, the more leptin you have. The less fat you have, the less leptin you have. And one of its key roles, leptin, is to signal to the brain to actually inform your body how much fat is on board. Okay? How much fat are you carrying at any one point? Um, why is this an important piece of information? Because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. Okay, so clearly for humans, not a problem today, we have too much food. But in the past, when we never had enough food, this would have been a very useful integer to actually hold in your head. Okay, it was just a survival instinct. How much long term energy stores do I do, do, do I actually do I actually have? And like I said, leptin is, is secreted into the blood from from fat and signals to the brain. And from there, okay, from that initial cloning of leptin in 1994, we now have a general idea of how our brain actually controls food intake. So your brain needs actually two pieces of information, right? So the first piece of information I've already talked to you guys about, which is it needs to know how much fat you have, um, because how much fat you have, how long you'd last in a while without any food. But the other thing which your brain needs to know is it needs to know what you have eaten and what you're currently eating. And this will come from your gastrointestinal tract, okay? So your GI, your food to poop tube and all the microbiota that are actually in there as well. So your uh, uh, gut, your entire GI tract and your fat, they secrete, uh, they secrete hormones and other nutritional cues which signal to the brain and your brain then senses these long-term and short-term signals, responds and translates these signals and then influences your next interaction with food. 
And they are genetic influences that actually modify the entire pathway and profile. And we can harness these in order to try and understand some of the pathways that actually, that actually influence, um, influence food intake. In fact, we now know, and I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about this. This is the first allegorical dog, dog which is what we call the leptin melanocortin pathway. So what is the leptin melanocortin pathway? It's uh, a leptin produced from fat, as I mentioned, which signals to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, where it then triggers the uh, processing of a gene called a uh, protein called POMC, P-O-M-C, which is then processed into a number of different uh, um, um, hormones and peptides, neurohormones and neuropeptides to signal to the melanocortin 4 receptor or MC4 receptor resulting in a influence of food intake. Okay, I'm gonna go back and actually give you examples of, of, of these so, um, um, just to show you what I'm, I'm actually uh, talking about. So the first question, okay, that, that came to mind, and this is where my, uh, still the current director of our institute, um, Professor Stephen O'Reilly um, um, came, came on board and he asked the question, whether or not if a naturally occurring mutation could occur in a one mammalian species, the mouse, okay, uh, causing severe obesity, could the, same, could the same thing be true in humans? So, 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 so in other words, is this mutation of the leptin system more broadly applicable across other mammalian species? Or was this a weird kind of like a mousy thing? It's entirely possible it could be a weird mousy thing because mice are just obviously small, furry, fuzzy, and has whiskers, and, and, and we don't. To cut a long story short, um, um, Steve Ratley and his, at the time, clinical fellow, uh, Sadaf Faruqi, now Professor Sadaf Faruqi, um, went looking, and they found the first humans um, um, actually with mutations within the leptin gene. And so these are two first cousins, okay, of Pakistani origin, who carry mutations within, the, um, within leptin. So these are kids with, it's a different, these are different mutations, but in, this, in the human version of the gene for, for leptin. So what do these kids look like? Well, you can see that these kids, uh, uh, well, you can see they're severely obese, but they're actually born of normal birth weight. And then they become hyperphagic after weaning. So hyper for more, phagic for eat, right? Now, this is a pathogenic term. You can't say, oh, I was hyperphagic last night. No, no, dude, you ate too much, right? So, so hyperphagia is a pathogenic term in terms of their response to food. So for, for example, these kids have to have their freezer doors locked up because otherwise they'll actually have the, they'll actually go in to eat the frozen fish fingers, okay? It sounds a bit you, I, I appreciate that, but actually I'm gonna come back and give you some examples um, um, and put you in a position where that is not as you or as funny as you might actually imagine it is. And you can see the rest of this, okay? There's no change in energy expenditure. We can measure a lot of fat, normal height, but they don't undergo puberty and they have an impaired immune function, which seems to be an odd thing to talk about in an obesity food intake talk. But it turns out it's these last two um, phenotypes which have really gave us some insight into the role of leptin, okay? So I'll come back to that in, 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 in a second. So, uh, oh. Hold on. Sorry. Okay, so uh, let's have a closer look at this child. Okay, so this is, a, or one of the one of the ch children. So this is the younger boy. Look, this is a three-year-old weighing 42 kilograms, all right? So this is not, I mean, just for some perspective, I am 75 kilograms. So this is a three-year-old who's two-thirds of my body weight. This is not a few too many fizzy pop drinks PlayStation type of chubbiness. Uh, this is severe obesity because of a lack of a, of, of, of a single gene. So Steve Ratley once again entered um, and entered the scene and asked the question, well, hang on a second. You know, if uh, taking the analogy of type one diabetes in which people lack insulin and you can replace uh, uh, your, yourself with injectable insulin to therefore manage your glucose homeostasis, the question is, can you actually inject someone with leptin and manage their fat homeostasis. And so, uh, uh, so he, and once again, Sadaf Faruqi went and actually did the experiment and lo and behold, they could, okay? And so this is that same child, now seven years old, well, not now, you can see the date, 1999, weighing 32 kilograms. Now at the time, the um, patent for leptin, okay, was held by the American pharmaceutical giant, Amgen. Um, uh, so it was, uh, sorry, licensed to, it was held by Rockefeller, licensed to the American pharmaceutical giant, Amgen. Now, you know, to have been a fly on the wall when these data come in, I mean, they must have thought that all their Christmases had come in one fell swoop because they had cured 
obesity, okay? Except they hadn't, because as you can see here, when this particular study was published in 1999, and we are now in 2020, uh, 21 years later, and leptin is certainly not a panacea for, if you have heard of it, leptin is certainly not a panacea for obesity or for body weight. So the question is why, all right? It's not like Amgen didn't try. Amgen gave leptin to fat people, old people, young people, boys, girls, females, people of all shades of purple, gray, and blue, all right? Um, but there was one universal truth. If you had a functioning leptin system, so these kids, uh, uh, this child does not have a functioning leptin system, but if you had a functioning leptin system, then it didn't matter um, whether or not you were BMI, I don't know, 17 or 18, like Kate Moss, okay? Or you had the body habitus of Santa Claus, okay? It, it didn't matter because you did not respond to additional leptin being injected into you. But the question is, why? Okay, when if you didn't have leptin, you responded exquisitely sensitively to, to, to injected leptin. So when, we, uh, when leptin was first discovered, 1994, 1995, I mean, we were all bamboozled, all of us within the field, because we thought that, well, hang on a second, leptin is produced from fat, more fat, more leptin, that we thought that it was there as a negative feedback loop, more fat, more leptin and more leptin, you eat less. And so therefore you control the amount of fat. And in, in some ways, this experiment with this principle for that, except if you thought a little, bit, uh, a little bit about it and realized that it doesn't actually make a lot of sense because we never had enough food. So if we never had enough food, why would we have evolved an entire system, okay, to regulate the amount of fat that we have, or at least to let us know how that we had too much fat? We never would have that the, the evolutionary pressure would not have been there. So just to just to cut a long story short, as it turns out, leptin does not function when there is too much of it sloshing about to let your brain know you have too much fat. Leptin functions as it disappears to let yourself to let your body know when you have too little fat. Because what happens when you have too little fat? You are starving. Leptin functions as it disappears to turn on the starvation response. Okay, so what is the starvation response? Okay, so that's a, that, that is a question to actually ask. Well, the first thing you got to do is eat, clearly, okay, unsur unsurprisingly. And, um, and so it, people think, well, that's obvious. Now, just think about it for a second there. Okay, Oops, sorry, 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 guys. Um, so just, just, just think about it for a second. Imagine uh, uh, you know that when you guys are um, hungry, okay, everything tastes great, okay, it's the, the, the simplest foods, a little bit of rice, a little bit of cheese, some, some crackers, whatever, tastes fantastic, but the fuller you become, the more picky you become with your food, all right, so this phenomenon we go through every, every single day, but imagine if you were starving, actually starving, plane crash in the Andes, uh, your, your partner is looking delicious, starving, would you end up eating frozen fish fingers to keep yourself alive? Yes, you would, okay, all of us, all humans, all mammals for that matter, become hyperphagic when you are actually starving. So in spite of the body habitus of this child, okay, with lots of fat, this is a child with a brain that thinks he is starving, okay? And because there's no leptin, because there's a broken signal between the amount of fat and his brain, he thinks it's starving and therefore the weird uh, um, um, eating behavior that they, that they actually have. Now, uh, what, what about the other two phenoty phenotypes I talked to you about? Well, now that comes from the fact that the other starvation response is you begin to try and save energy for your brain. Because your brain, while two to 3% of your body weight and volume, um, at rest, it uses up 25% of the circulating glucose in your blood. Horrendously metabolically expensive but it does all the command and control, right? So your brain is very, very important for that. So your body begins to, to shut off metabolically expensive, but immediately unimportant pathways to keep yourself alive. So one of which is reproduction, which ladies, as you know, that time of the month, loads of wasted calories, okay? And so you, which at, at the edge of starvation is the difference between life and death. So your, your, your brain just shuts the whole thing off. Plus, if you were actually starving, the last thing you're going to want to do is to pop a baby out into the Serengeti because you're not going to be able to feed the baby. So your, your, your brain shuts the whole damn system off. Okay. Now, the second thing, uh, uh, which is very expensive, is your immune system. And your brain also shuts that off because um, um, in order to preserve calories. And people say, well, I'll die of an infection. You're going to die of starvation before you die of an infection. This is a triage situation. And the whole thing, the beauty of the system is the whole thing is reversible because when you give the child back leptin, you can see that A, 
Hyperphagia is fixed. So the body weight is, is goes back to normal. Reproduction, the older cousin I showed you previously, remember this is 1999. Um, it's the first leptin deficient human, uh, the leptin deficient creature in all of evolution to carry a baby to term. Okay, she's now, uh, she's now a mother. And so reproduction fixed. Immune system, I haven't shown you the data, also fixed. And that is the role of leptin to turn on the starvation response. So what then happens when leptin signals to the brain? I told you about POMC, P-O-M-C within, within the hypothalamus. Now at this point, I could show you examples of humans with mutations in POMC, and they would look like the child over here on the left-hand side, except with bright red hair. I could show you- yeah. Okay, I think the CB channel is working. It's working, it's running. Um, you're all on again. All right. Um, I will text Giles. No, I'm here. Yeah, I will. I will you can start again. And um, Do we have our audience back. I don't know if we have audience back. <laughs> we have a few people coming back. Um, we, we can, I heard something. Um, we can wait for a few minutes, like a, a minute and see I we have. Why don't we, um, coming back. A couple of questions came in. Would it be worth just asking a question or two before you resume? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you want to. Um, so there was a question about, well, you, you may make millions if you figure this one out, but how can we make our body choose fat as a primary energy source so that overweight people can slim down? Oh, my good. Uh, our, our body does use fat as a primary energy source. The, the, the major issue is not that it doesn't use it as an energy source, it's the amount of fat that we actually carry. So, so for example, um, we probably carry the, the primary Protein is not a huge fuel for us. Okay, so what happens is when we eat protein, we tend to build it either as muscles, um, or we kind of uh, it gets ejected from our from our body. Broadly speaking, that's slightly simplistic. So largely, our fuels are going to be uh, glucose, uh, carbohydrates, or they're going to be fat. But we only carry if you count the um, glucose in our blood and the glycogen in our muscles and in our in our liver. We probably carry only about 2,000, 2,500 calories of, of carbohydrates in us, right? However, we carry 180,000 calories of fat, okay? So, so at the end of the day, the reason for, for, for that we, we use fat primarily as fuel is just that we have a lot of fat. And it's, it's a very efficient way to actually, to actually store. It takes a long time to burn because it's evolved to take a long time to burn. That's the, that, that's the answer. So sorry for the depressing answer. Okay, I have confirmation that people are back. So I think you continue now, please. All right, I'll redo the, I'll redo the Labrador bit. Um, okay. I just took, I don't know when I, I don't know when I cut out. So um, guys, sorry for the uh, technical hitch. I'm, I'm just wondering whether or I was responsible for that because I showed some previously published but uh, 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 pictures which I referenced, I want to point out. But anyway, hi, I'm Giles, I'm back. Um, so uh, we, we were talking about leptin and what happens when leptin then signals to the brain. And when it signals to the brain, it then actually, the processing of a protein called POMC or POMC begins. Now at this point, as I said previously, I could talk about humans with POMC mutations and they would look like those leptin kids. I could take out, talk about mice which we knocked the gene out and they would look like they are the, the um, leptin deficient mouse. Um, but I thought I would share with you some information um, that we have on Labradors. Now, Labradors are the most food motivated dog that we, that we know of. And this work was led by a veterinary surgeon colleague of mine, Eleanor Raffin, who did a PhD in human genetics and then went back to becoming a, a vet. And she was always interested in trying to understand why Labradors were quite as uh, food motivated as they were. Okay, so should we did, we threw the kind of genetic book at it. Um, but to cut a long story short, um, Labradors, as it turns out, hang on a second, Labradors, as it turns out, have a deletion in POMC. Not all of them, okay, but some of them do. And so if you actually map what it looks like to, to Labradors with out without the deletion, with one copy of the deletion and when two copies of the deletion, and this is body weight, you'll see that you have an increase or the dog has an increased body weight, the more deletion copies it actually carries. And so each deletion of POMC 
is worth a couple of kilos to the dog. It doesn't sound like a lot, but remember, Labradors only get to around 35 uh, kilos or so, all right? And if we do the same thing for food motivation, what drives them to eat, you see exactly the same pattern, okay? So Labradors, a percentage of Labradors carry a mutation in POMC that makes them more food motivated, all right? So, um, so these are the scores on the door. I, I, I already mentioned this. So each deletion allele is worth a couple of kilos, um, which is about 0.3 of a standard deviation actually of, um, of, of body weight. So as I said, not all Labradors have it. Maybe about, I don't know, 20 to 25% of Labradors, 20% as heterozygous or carrying one copy and 2% carrying two copies. But three quarters of Labradors are wild type so that they don't have the deletion. And yet 95% of Labradors are really highly food motivated. So anyway, so um, El Eleanor is in the process uh, um, of, of going through and throwing the genetic book at this to try and find out uh, um, what else is there. But so far, so boring, because I've told you that humans and mice already, we already know about the importance of, of, of POMC. So here's the thing. Okay, so Labradors are actually very, uh, uh, the, the commonest pet dog, okay, in North America and in uh, matter. Um, they are wonderful family pets. Uh, you know, they got a wonderful temperament, but they're also very, very trainable. In fact, they're so trainable, they're primarily used as guide dogs for the blind. Okay. And you know, like guide dogs for the blind are trained, uh, uh, immensely trained because they're about to be given a human being to take care of for the rest of their life. Okay. They're trained within an inch of their life. They're like Navy SEALs of the dog world. And interestingly, they're trained with food using standard Pavlovian training um, um, techniques. Okay. And so, um, and, and so you have the situation where you have dogs which are then selected and selected and selected because there's huge failure rate for dogs who are going to be very, very trainable. And if you actually uh, uh, look at Labrador guide dogs, of which are some part of our cohort are, 80% of Labrador guide dogs have the deletion in POMC. So, he, he, so here's the concept. So imagine you have a, a guide dog bringing home visually impaired Mr. Smith, all right? And imagine if suddenly a squirrel or chicken runs across the road. So what are the chances of a chicken dinner for the Labrador? I don't know, 50-50, 80-20, it doesn't matter because the Labrador is trained, okay, that, uh, that it will have a 100% chance of dinner if it brings Mr. Smith home. And so uh, uh, what happens, we started by looking at, uh, um, you know, food motivation. And because of the way the dogs were trained, we have now got into something called uh, into trainability, which we found very, very uh, interesting. So we ended up on the cover of, uh, of, of, of the journal, Cell Metabolism. That's Jasper, one of our participants. And that is Eleanor, who is, who is actually the lead, um, who is actually the lead of the study. So for those of you with dogs and, and, uh, uh, and they have these googly eyes and thinking, oh, Fido, he loves me. Fido doesn't love you. He's hungry. Mm, there we go. So now what then happens when POMC is, um, is processed into these peptides? Well, they then signal to the MC4 receptor, the banana cotton 4 receptor, resulting in an influence in food intake. And, and we now know that in humans, for example, that mutations in the MC4 receptor, you'll, you'll now be unsurprised, actually results in severe, in severe obesity, as it was true in POMC, as it was true in, in leptin. The difference, however, is that mutations in MC4 receptor are a lot more common, okay? We probably think that 1% of all people with a BMI above 30 will have mutations within the MC4 receptor, making them more obese, influencing their food intake. And just in case you think this is a human-specific thing, it isn't, okay? It isn't a human-specific thing because there are actually a lot of agricultural species, for example, pigs, okay? So this particular pig, which makes a particularly good back bacon, okay, has also has a missense mutation, a mutation within the MC4 receptor, getting it to naturally eat more, grow faster, and so therefore, and, and without being hormone injected or hormone or hormone fed. And just in case you think this is a mammalian specific thing, not so, all right? Because here are blind Mexican cave fish. Mm -hmm, that's right. So not only are they uh, not only are they fish, they're blind. Not only are they blind, they're Mexican. Okay, so this is a uh, boring fish. Okay, we just just sit there doing anything. Now the cave fish are fish that are found in uh, uh, in the caves uh, underneath. You know where the big asteroid that hit that killed the dinosaur hit the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are a lot of caves there, and some of the fish got trapped in there. And because they got trapped in there, and there's no light. Their eyes have evolved away, so they're blind. Um, but because there's hardly any food there, 
every time one iota of food goes in, okay, the, the fish have to be food motiv motivated enough to eat every scrap of food that they can find within this food poor environment to stay alive. So much so that all of the blind Mexican cave fish, okay, in these, in these, stuck in these caves, have mutations in MC4 receptor because those are the ones that were food motivated enough to stay alive. Blind Mexican cave fish. And while those are sort of like mutations in genes that cause big phenotypes, the leptin melanocortin pathway also plays a very important role in common obesity. Okay, so in other words, in, in a normal variation of body weight rather than just um, specific mutations in extreme, in extreme phenotypes. So this is a what we call a Manhattan plot for genome-wide association studies. Okay, so in other words, we're, we're, we're now looking at a population and asking what subtle changes could there be which influence body weight. Now, I haven't spent uh, any time talking about FTO at all, um, and, I, and I won't. I've spent the last 12, 13 years of my life studying this, and so I won't share you the very, very sad story, except that these are not mutations. Okay, so these are very different. Because for example, for those of you listening to me at the moment, half of you will have the risk variation in FTO, which makes you slightly heavier, about three, uh, a kilo and a half heavier than the person sat next to you who doesn't. If you have two copies uh, um, of the variation in FTO, that's one sixth of you or about a billion people in the world, you'll be on average three kilograms heavier, okay? Um, um, so these are not mutations and all of you will have some mix of these variations of genes that are here. And what are they? If you look, that is POMC over here and that is the MC4 receptor. Now, these are not deletions. These are not mutations. These are very, very subtle variations. So what we have seen is that if you have severe mutations in these genes, such as POMC, MC4, leptin, leptin receptor, you end up with severe obesity, okay? But if you have very, very subtle variations, they, inf they influence where you sit on the normal distribution of body weight. So what role for the microbiome? Why am I here in actually a, a, a microbiome um, a day speaking? Well, listen, I, I, I consider the microbiome as an extension, and in fact, no, as an interface between the environment and our genes, right? The microbiome is there. It is a wonderful reflection of our health. It is a wonderful reflection of our, of, of our environment. Um, and therefore what we eat, where we live, how healthy we are, it influences the, 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 um, the, the variety of the microbiome that is there. But the microbiome also produces metabolites. So in particular, the microbiome that's actually uh, um, there in the colon is able to fer ferment, for example, soluble, fi uh, soluble fiber, producing um, short chain fatty acids. Now these short chain fatty acids can actually signal to the brain um, and actually influence uh, uh, how full or how hungry you might actually feel. And so I'm not trying to take away from, from the, you know, being separate things, being genetics, environment, the microbiome. The microbiome, I feel, is the interface between the environment, reflecting the environment, and plays an important role in signaling to our brain and actually influencing food intake. So I guess just in the last couple of, uh, last couple of thoughts. So the first one is, you, you know, am I giving anyone an excuse? Okay, am, am I giving fat people an, an excuse? And I, I'm going to say no. So I think you've got to consider your your genes, this is, this is your, your, um, your hand of genes. It's kind of like a hand of poker, okay? You've got good hands, you've got bad hands, and the only people you can blame really are your folks, to be fair, because they gave them to you, okay? But here's the thing. You can win with a bad hand of poker. It's just more difficult. I'll, I'll, I'll give you another, or you can lose with a good hand of poker for, for, for that matter. I'll give you another example. I will never, ever run as fast as Usain Bolt, and it's my genes, I'm going with that. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that if I train, I won't run faster than I do now, okay? So I'm gonna skip the dessert tummy bit. So I guess here, here's the question with regards to, are we all sinners, okay? So, so are, are fat people bad and lazy and, and, and everything? And this is a picture of me uh, eating food that's terrible for your microbiome pizza. Uh, and, and I guess here's the thing. Okay, when we talk about um, of gluttony, when we talk about sin, when we talk about uh, um, you know feeding behavior uh, being sinful and, and 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 things, you know, we are assuming that there is a choice involved, and there is to some degree. And I am clearly choosing to eat the pizza, but you have to remember that we do not gain weight or lose weight 
overnight, sadly, for some people, okay? Our feeding, our body weight is a function of thousands of different feeding decisions that we have made over the past few years. Now, imagine if because of your biological hand, because of your genes, you are slightly less likely to say no, not 10 times, say a few percentage points less likely to say no, 5%. Then over thousands of different feeding decisions, those are tens of thousands of calories that you would have eaten extra, which is why some people are small, they're medium, they're large, and this is me choosing to eat a broccoli. So people who are living with obesity, people who are fat, they are not bad. They're not morally bereft. You, you, you know, they are fighting their biology. It doesn't change the physics of the problem, okay? Uh, um, there's a very big dis uh, a distinction between pointing out the problem that we are in the middle of an obesity epidemic and blaming the people suffering from the problem. People who are suffering from obesity are fighting their biology. They're not bad people. So uh, this is just with huge thanks. And I know I'm, I'm running late, so I'll be brief about this. This is uh, Steve Ratley, who's our, uh, and Tony Cole, my senior colleagues, and the, the rest of the team who have actually done a lot of the work. I'm at the MRC Metabolic Diseases Unit. I'm funded by the um, BBSRC as well. And I'm based at the University of Cambridge. You can follow me on Twitter if you are interested. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Giles. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thanks everyone who came back on the live stream. Sorry for that. Um, Roshin, would you like to deal with the questions just for a couple before we go to the next speaker? Yes, so there are a couple of questions that came up. Um, one was what other possible diseases um, could, or in which diseases could leptin be used as a diagnostic marker? A diagnostic marker. So. Um... Well, leptin, as I say, is a diag uh, uh, gnosis of how much fat you have. So the one um, thing which leptin is being uh, used at at the moment is when you have a problem making fat. It's a very rare condition. It's a rare condition called lipodystrophy. And lipo so, so because of some genetic reason, you aren't able to make fat. This sounds great until you realize that the safest place to store fat is in your fat cells, okay? Because if it doesn't go into your fat cells, it goes into your liver, it goes into your muscle, it causes all kinds of metabolic havoc. And so one of the things which uh, people with lipodystrophy is they're actually iller, they're actually more ill than the people who carry too much fat because people who carry too much fat at least have a fat reservoir. Whereas people who are very skinny with no, uh, um, without the leptin. So you can actually give leptin um, back there uh, as well. So that's not an indicator per se, but that's certainly one of the treatments that are actually out there at the moment. Okay, um, I'm going to summarize a couple of questions in the interest of time. So there's mm -hmm. a couple of um, questions about eating disorders. So one asking um, whether there's research into how the microbiome might be affected, but also what genes might be associated with eating disorders like anorexia or binge eating. So when I first started, that's a very good question. When I first started um, in this field 20, whatever, year, years ago, I think we, we were thinking, is something like anorexia the opposite of something like leptin deficiency, right? So in other words, both are eating disorders and that on a spectrum. And I think that was a reasonable thing to ask. I'm not an eating disorder expert. I just wanna, I just wanna point this out. However, I think the field now uh, understands that something like anorexia is not the opposite of, of, of leptin, you know, it uses the same pathways in terms of controlling food intake. All of the signals which lets the, and someone who's suffering from anorexia know that they're starving are there. The, anor the, the person suffering from anorexia for whatever psychological uh, uh, reasons are able to ignore the signals. But there is a genetic influence on it, just not as strong as you might imagine for something like BMI. Um, and uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of studies that are actually out there that are looking at the genetics of, of anorexia. Uh, Royston, you're muted. Uh, so that's great. I think there is a slight delay in the questions coming in, but in the interest of time, I really think we need to move on. That's all uh, right. What we will do is we'll um, collect some of the questions that are coming in. Some of you had questions for our first speaker. And what we'll do is we'll see how we, how we can get those answered for you and put them on the um, YouTube if that's technically possible. So I think we're gonna go on to our next speaker. Thank you so much again, uh, Giles, that was fantastic. Uh, Anthe, you wanna introduce our next speaker? Yes, of course. Um, so now we're traveling a bit further away from Cambridge or wherever you are, we're going actually to Copenhagen to David Zilber's kitchen. David is a professional chef and fermenter, a butcher and photographer who hails from Toronto, Canada. He has worked in some of the world's, world's top kitchens since 2004 
and he served as the director of fermentation lab at NOMA from 2016 until 2020, very recently. Uh, in there, he um, co-authored along with Rene Rajepi the New York Times best-selling NOMA Guide to Fermentation. David, with his deep love and passion for sciences, as well as arts, has become a voice for science communication for a new generation of cooks and enthusiasts in the world of food and fermentation. Welcome, David. The floor is all yours. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, um, speaking alongside some legit amazing scientists whose work I look up to um, and helps to inform me about, um, you know, the world of fermentation that I kind of fell into. Um, now, fermentation is a, a, a practice and way of looking at food that exists all around us. I mean, I don't know how many of the uh, attendees here or other speakers might have started their morning with a cup of coffee uh, or a slice of bread and cheese or maybe some honeyed oats with yogurt um, or even snacked on a, a sandwich with some Dijon mustard on it for lunch. But, even just in saying those statements about foods that we consider so regular, so everyday and so commonplace, we often forget that microbes have had a hand, a huge hand, in making those things edible at all. Microbes have been around us since time in the world. Indeed, they are the, the first form of life to have graced uh, the face of the earth, going back as, as far as you know, the RNA world somewhere in a, a swampy coast or maybe deep in geothermal vent some four billion years ago. But that very notion that somehow the, the tiniest organisms on Earth are also the most ancient and somehow still today the most numerous uh, and important for the planetary um, ecosphere is something that absolutely carries a huge amount of weight and importance to us in our daily lives. Now, as human beings with the many, many trillions of uh, human cells that make us up, we often sometimes forget that there's a lot more to our everyday environments and a lot more to our even our, our own bodies uh, than we like to ascribe, you know, our, our own kind of egotistical purpose to. Sure, I get up out of bed in the morning and I think, okay, well, I'm going to have a great day, but you don't, you don't seem to uh, give credit to all of the mites and microbes and yeast cells that thrive on you that allow you to have that, that great day. Sure, you get up and say, I want to make a sandwich, but you also don't give credit to all of the microbes that help to make all that food edible in the first place. So I think that there is this huge shift, not just in the world of, of sciences and, and human health and, uh, and, and practices like dietary health, um, but also in the world of understanding you know, on a daily basis what we eat, that there is such a grandeur that we're only just waking up to. Um, and that grandeur is something that we can also, if we're smart about it, harness and use to our benefit. So today, while you know the, the world is coming out of lockdown, um, I'm going to teach you how to ferment. And it might be shockingly easy. Fermentation is something that people are often afraid of because they get that there is this you know, unseen world of, of microbes. Which ones are germs? Which ones are gonna hurt me? Which ones are out to get me? But they also don't seem to remember that, you know, these are the same microbes that have kept our civilizations alive for many, many thousands of years. You might think that it's somehow an involved process that, okay, well, it takes a lot of time. What if I'm not there to look up and check up on it? You also have to remember that these microbes basically drive their own existence and they'll decide when the time is right to either flourish or, or fade out or pass the baton onto another colony or another uh, set of organisms. So it's super important to understand that once you understand what the microbes need to do their job, it's like pressing play and letting nature take its course. Yes, you do need to check up on it. Yes, you should know the warning signs. But as a fermenter, as someone who wants to take microbes into their kitchen and understand how they can work for them, you just have to understand that you're also just a shepherd, really. You don't get to dictate what the microbes do. You can analyze until the cows come home under a microscope with gene sequencers and laboratories just what exactly is growing in your yogurt. 
but you can also just take a spoonful, eat it, and trust that, well, if it tastes like yogurt and it's delicious, that all the microbes that are supposed to be there are there. So, as I said, today we're going to ferment something that is very simple, very dear to my heart here in Copenhagen, gooseberries. These are green gooseberries, which are absolutely in season right now. They are tart and sweet and plump and full of edible seeds and sour. They're a Scandinavian favorite and their skins are already covered in all the yeasts and bacteria that will turn these into something far more interesting in one week's time. And that's the beauty of fermentation. So many of the microbes that you need to do anything at all are already present in the environment, waiting for you to give them the right to just have fun and transform your food for you. These were picked from an organic farm. Um, if there's visible dirt on them, give them a light wash under the sink, but these are ready to go by my books. We are going to take a scale, put our bowl on the scale, and tear it. Add in our gooseberries, 600 grams. And to those 600 grams of gooseberries, we are going to add in 2% salt, which will be 12 grams. This is just flake sea salt. There are reasons why you wouldn't want to use iodized salt, um, basically because iodine can kind of get in and disrupt the living pathways of, of the microbes that we're looking to actually propagate. So just using normal flake sea salt is kind of the, the, the best standard way to go about this. We're just gonna give these a toss, salt in there, and then we're going to get our jar and pour all of this in. What's that salt doing? Well, that's our point of control. If, like I said, you remember that we're trying to be a shepherd here, all that salt is, is our border collie, telling the sheep where they can and can't go. That salt is our fence, allowing the sheep to stay corralled in a given area that they're not going to wander too far from. And simultaneously keep the wolves out of your pasture. And this jar is indeed that pasture. You have to think about microbes like you have to think about sheep. You're not in control of the sheep's brain. The sheep will ultimately decide where the grass is greener, where it wants to grow, but you can allow the sheep only so much liberties and only so much freedom to move around in the pasture. And you know, at the end of the season, you should have a lot of wool and a lot of lamb and a lot of meat for harvest. And the same thing goes for a bowl of gooseberries or any fruit for that matter. So now that we have our gooseberries and salt in our jar, we just need one final point of control, one extra border collie in the field to make sure that these microbes are going to go exactly where we want them to. And that is a little bit of weight. I'm just going to use a standard little Ziploc bag. Fill it with water because water is, well, for one, heavy, but also liquid, which helps it to take the shape of whatever I want to put it in. And while you can get fancy fermenting equipment, these beautiful ceramic or glass weights that will fit exactly inside your ball jar, will weigh the exact same as this bag of water will, and will fit in there all the same. So our berries are now under a little bit of pressure, which once the salt through osmosis starts to draw that juice out of the berries, it will create a water line and the weight on top of the berries will start to displace it, and you'll have an anaerobic environment, which, like I said, is our last point of control. That anaerobic environment is going to keep out not just malevolent bacteria, but malevolent molds, because most molds, most fungi, are aerobic, which means that they need oxygen to grow and propagate. And if you kick them out, and with the salt, have an ability to keep pathogenic bacteria at bay, you are going to be fermenting. In a week's time, this will look like this.
or the magic of television or Zoom broadcast, whatever you want to think. The berries have let out their juices. We'll take out this water weight. They smell completely different, aromatic, savory. Um, their color has gone a little bit musty. You can see all of the juices that that's let out, pooling at the bottom of that container. And if I'm to reach in and grab one of these, they've tensed up a little bit. And they are so different, so flavorful. You would want to put that on to fish, use the juices to cure ceviche, throw it into your salad, then you have this caper-like complexity that a normal, unfermented fruit just doesn't offer. And to be honest, and it's not just because these are seasoned with salt, but there is something that is quantifiably more delicious about fermented foods versus their raw counterparts. And there's a reason for that. When you employ microbes to break down foods you're looking to preserve, and this is indeed preserved. These berries would have rot or molded in my fridge after probably just a few weeks. These ones I can keep almost indefinitely. And why is that? It's because all of the bacteria that I've used to ferment these things have created lactic acid, which has now lowered the pH of the entire batch, so the entire contents of this jar, and will now basically keep it pickled until I'm ready to eat it all. But to make that happen, the bacteria that we've now grown and propagated in this jar also had to do some eating of their own. And through their metabolisms, through their breaking down of all the sugars, all the carbohydrates, all the glucose that sat in those berries, they've done a lot more than just produce lactic acid as a byproduct. They've also broken down proteins into their constituent peptides and amino acids that to us taste delicious because we've now outsourced a lot of the act of digestion to the microbes responsible for preservation. When your body tastes a free-floating amino acid, the basic constituent building blocks of proteins, the very things that Giles just said, you actually don't get a lot of energy from. And that's this is true. It takes a lot of work to burn protein, but at the same time, your body needs those basic building blocks of proteins to synthesize all of the proteins that make up your own body. So it's a lot of recycling, not just coal into the furnace. And because of your taste buds, which have been trained by evolution over the course of hundreds of millions of years, if you go far back enough in time, you have a differential weighting in between the raw ingredients that make up all the things you need to make you, you. When you taste those pre-digested byproducts of fermentation in something like a fermented food, you recognize it as more delicious and you're more drawn to it. Taste is Darwinian. It propels you to seek it out. It propels you to recreate the very actions that produced that fermented food in the first place and keep doing it. And so we have this sort of self-reinforcing feedback loop where somewhere back in time, deep in our history, there was some sort of accidental confluence of circumstances that led us to be drawn to a fermented food over a row. And whether that was just us recognizing that, okay, okay, the cabbages that were sitting in that corner of the cellar when we harvested our wild foods somehow managed to sour because there was maybe a salt residue sitting in that corner. And somehow the right combination of bacteria managed to leave those things edible longer, you would naturally be drawn to that. Or our ancestors were in way. And in the act of understanding the process that got us there without even needing to understand what microbes were at play, just the large strokes of cultural transmission we have kept doing this for thousands and thousands of years. And those cultural traditions are still alive today, being seen in completely new ways, being transformed and translated to new ingredients in different parts of the world. A sauerkraut of berries isn't something that maybe anyone would have explicitly called a recipe 50 years ago, but today is something that people are doing in kitchens and in their homes all over the world. And that's an important thing to understand, that there is an understanding of what microbes are doing in our food on a much more public and, and, and communal basis than there ever has been before. I mean, the word microbiome was only coined in the turn of the uh, century, 2001, by Josh Letterberg. 
But you also have to think that my own grandmother of Polish heritage had a folkloric understanding that, hey, if you got a flight of, micro, of, of antibiotics, eat yogurt afterwards for a week. Why? Because it'll help settle your gut. Even though she never went to university, even though she never understood what lactobacillials would be doing to her gut lining or doing to all the nutrients you ingested or doing to outnumber through, through uh, a colony protection of her own insides, she understood that because her grandmother used to feed her yogurt when she got sick or when she had that, that she should do that for her father who did it for me, who now has read enough books about it to understand that, hey, this stuff is actually good for you. Now, I should take a little bit of time to settle some hype around what fermentation will actually do in your life. Yes, there are dozens and dozens of papers that confirm that in traditional societies, people who eat large quantities of fermented foods on a daily basis, like so much so that their entire you know, farmstead villages are, are built around these practices, do display very different microbiome than those of weird people like us in the West, Western, educated, intellectual, I forget the rest of the acronym, but you get the point. And that's because their microbiomes are basically this blurred boundary between the outside world and the inside world. The largest organ on your body, your skin, is built to be a boundary that is not so permeable when it comes to the inside and outside world. It's designed to be that kind of first line of defense. Now, when you think about your body as a three-dimensional being. There's a lot of holes for in and out, but there's one hole that goes all the way through you, and that's your GI tract. And your GI tract is meant to be the main interface in between the outside world and the inside world. All of your senses aid in your survival. But like I said, the sense of taste and the sense of smell, which are very interlinked, are extremely important and almost take a primacy because they're the only senses that are completely dedicated to figuring out what parts of the world to make into yourself. Now, when you keep that idea in mind, yeah, your sense of bitterness is maybe a, a biological evolution, uh, evolutionary tactic to help you avoid eating poisonous plants. Your sense of sweet taste is meant to draw you towards fruits and calorie-rich things that will fuel your body and allow you to run a mile more to, to find a mate or find shelter or outrun a leopard that's, that's chasing you from behind. Your sense of saviness is meant to, to dictate umami and all of the protein-rich foods that will help make your body strong and give you all the basic building blocks. All of these tastes are deeply woven into you and have, have basically programmed a lot of our cultural behaviors uh, over millions and millions of years. Now again, getting back to what that means to ferments. When you have a deeply embedded cultural practice of eating fermented foods on a regular basis, like I said, the inside and outside of your body end up blurring. There's going to be a, uh, a big reinforcement in mirror image of the bacteria that are responsible for making, let's say, Bulgarian yogurt, if your mother is stirring up fresh batches of Bulgarian yogurt every day somewhere in the Eastern Caucasus. And guess what? All of those same microbes, those three billion culture-forming units that would exist in each milliliter of yogurt will end up inside of you. Now that's very different from a prebiotic. A pill that you take, that you buy from the grocery store shelf, that you pop one in the morning and say, okay, I'm gonna change my life. There's only maybe 10 billion freeze-dried bacteria in one of those things, many of which aren't necessarily designed to live inside you many of which are just tourists that pass through, and they might not be doing you harm, but they might not be doing you the same amount of good as you think. And even still, in a lot of the fermented foods that you eat, whether that's a kombucha or vinegar or yogurt or sauerkraut or miso, lots of those microbes aren't gonna stick around and be the actual gut microbiota that will keep you regular, that will help to protect your gut from foreign infections, that will outcompete and outnumber a lot of pathogenic or opportunistic bacteria that might seek to set up space inside you. But there is something important to realize when it comes to fermented foods. Like I talked about with the idea that there's a lot of these 
peptides and, and free-floating amino acids and uh, short-chain fatty acids when a food has been fermented by microbes. Those aren't just good for you, they're also good for all of the microbes inside you. And that's a key thing to, to remember. Also think about the types of foods that you do ferment. You don't ferment bleached white bread, but you do ferment whole wheat bread when you make your sourdough. You don't ferment spinach, let's say, but you do ferment tough cabbages that can survive the breakdown and survive a week at room temperature without turning to mush. So there's a certain class of foods that lead themselves to being turned into ferments that can actually, well, have historically been used through recipes, but also are practically good for you to use in your cooking. And in that class of foods, whether they're legumes like soybeans for miso, or like I said, cabbages, hardy, winter greens, uh, for sauerkrauts or things like that, when those fermented foods get broken down, you're not just feeding yourself, you're feeding all the microbes inside you. Those microbes too want all of the byproducts that other microbes have pre-digested in an external stomach of a fermenting jar. And once they get inside you, you're bolstering those populations. They crave fiber. They crave some of these partially broken down molecules. And when you keep those populations inside you healthy, you're doing a great thing for yourself. Yes, you are eating live probiotic cultures that might help to set up shop, you know, elsewhere in your colon or, or, or in your small intestine, but that's not the big game of eating free fermented foods. You're eating a whole food when you eat a fermented food. You're eating something that came from the earth that hasn't been processed to, to oblivion, that hasn't been bleached and had its, its nutrients stripped out. In fact, more nutrients have been created when microbes have gotten to do their thing inside a jar like this. And once they get inside you, yeah, your body's going wild for those flavors, but so are all the microbes that are going to keep you healthy. Eating fermented foods is one of the best ways to improve and maintain gut microbiota diversity because they crave the fiber that lots of these things contain in themselves. And that's an important thing to realize. And I should speak a little bit more to that as well because the other day I was doing another conference for a fermentation festival and, and the funny question at the end was, if you could steal the gut microbiome of any famous person on earth, who would it be? Now, some of those answers were you know, tongue in cheek and funny. It was like, oh, Bruce Lee, so I could be strong and fast. Or, you know, I would steal Einstein's microbiome so I could be intelligent. But that's essentialism, and that doesn't, that doesn't hold any water. Your gut microbiome, where they are absolutely responsible for aiding in your well-being, in your psychological stability, in, in your mood every day, in your bowel movements, which obviously make you feel upset or anxious if you're in a meeting and you're trying to hold something that doesn't want to stay there. They aren't you. You're you, but you're not you without them. So to think that you can steal someone else's fire by stealing their microbiome, they might correct a C. Uh, a C. difficile infection, but they're not going to make you necessarily superhuman. An important thing to understand is that when we chase these terms like gut diversity, or when we look to you know, the, the Kalahari Bushmen to, to see what these people who forage you know, wild tubers for a living have living inside their guts, what's right for someone else isn't necessarily right for you. And I'm not saying that it's not a good thing to eat a, a wildly varied diet of lots of greens and lots of vegetables. There, are, there is a healthier way of eating than that of a standard American or European diet. But there is also a middle ground that we have to understand that chasing these, these very exotic and very foreign microbiomes isn't always necessarily, let's say, custom fit for everyone. There is a way to attune your microbiome to be as healthy as it can possibly be. And that's just almost common sense. Listening to your grandma, listening to your doctor when they say, eat your vegetables, eat lots of fiber, cut down on the fat, cut down on the sugars, don't, eat, don't drink soda pop. It's all stuff we know that we should be doing anyway. And that's one of the best parts is because it's not just about you, it's also about the microbes inside you. And what they do to live a healthy and fruitful life. Lots of that can be found in jars like this. That is not out of your reach to be able to 
making your own kitchen, as you saw, making a batch of fermented gooseberries took about two minutes of labor and then seven weeks or seven days of waiting. But nonetheless, it's something that's completely within everyone's reach because those microbes are within everyone's reach. Those microbes are your reach. They're on your hands. They're on the kitchen counter, even though I've just been this. They are on the berries, the foods you eat anyway. And when you give them a voice and allow them to propagate, and allow them to transform your food, you're edging your way not towards some sort of artificial construct of a human microbiome that's best for everyone, but one that's best for you, especially if you're eating locally, especially if you're going to the market and seeing what's in season and taking something that hasn't flown halfway around the world, but was grown by a local farmer just a few kilometers away. When you take the world around you and put it inside you through the best means possible, through some of the least intervening, but also best tasting methods available to you, you're doing not just good for you, not just good for the microbes inside you, but good for the environment, good for the microbial communities around you, good for your children when they see a practice like this executed on a daily basis, and good for their classmates when they look into that kid's lunchbox and say, oh, what, what would your mom cook for you today? Kimchi, how does that taste? And you get this sharing of, of cultures and cultures, quite literally, uh, that just help to reinforce this kind of collective web of, of the natural world that we are so very much a part of. So I know that we've had some time. David, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, the message I got from your talk is that fermentation is the bridge to understand our microbiome and manipulate our microbiome and stay healthy, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely is and absolutely can be. Great. Uh, we have a few questions coming in. Um, there is one about uh, the jar you used. Do you sterilize it first? I gave this a wash uh, just with soap and water. Uh, it had a ferment in it previously, so I'm not too worried about that. But if you do have a jar that's been sitting out on your counter or something like that, this is just a little spritzer of ethanol at 60%. It's not like hand sanitizer, so it doesn't have all of those thickening agents in it. But just ethanol and water diluted to 60%. And that's usually enough to sterilize your jar. Now, you don't need to put a jar into an autoclave or anything. We're not trying to isolate one strain among 10,000 in, in a genetics lab. We're just trying to make sure that there isn't some sort of like already stinky mold there. And you also have to realize that you're not gonna be able to sterilize the food before you put it in there. That's completely against the point. Um, you want those microbes to be able to thrive. So just so long as you're working clean, that's probably the most important, especially when you're practicing wild fermentation because that's what's gonna allow the microbes to thrive. Oh, there is another question. Uh, how did we know what to ferment and what not to ferment? Is that intuitive knowledge? I wouldn't call it intuitive knowledge, but I would almost call it autopoetic knowledge. And, and autopoiesis is, for those who don't know the meaning of that word, is self-created. And when I talk, when I, when I get that little aside into my imaginary thought experiment of of one of our ancestors realizing that a cabbage had stayed good while another had not, and just understanding the difference. Oh, was it a little bit saltier? Oh, did it not have access to air? What sort of container did I use? Those are the actual cultural traditions that have just manifested themselves in every form of fermentation that we practice to this day. There is no start date for the person to have brewed the first beer. There is no inventor of vinegar. There's no inventor of wine. These are, these are these relationships in between the plants, the ingredients we choose to eat, the humans who eat them, and the microbes who are present within those interactions that end up having their say in how we view these ingredients afterwards. Some things are better suited to ferment than others. Like I said, spinach will rot before it ferments or definitely ferments into anything delicious. Now there's ways of working with spinach so that you can incorporate it into a ferment, but a cabbage is going to stand up a lot better just for reasons of those plant physiologies. And you know the ancestors that have figured out what works and what doesn't, they were the ones who were still around to tell their children and their grandchildren, hey, this recipe worked really well. I should teach you how to do it so that you can teach your kids. That is this, this cultural evolution that works blindly 
um, but also deliciously through time. Yeah, through trial and error. <laughs> Um, there is another question. Um, have you done any work with historic ferments like kefir, grains, and if so, what is it about them that you think has made them so enduring as cultures? I would say that most every ferment is a historic ferment. Um, whether that's sourdough, um, whether that is uh, uh, kombucha, you know, it, it, it all has to come from somewhere. These are all germ lines of cells dating back to the dawn of time. They are our cousins. Um, and they all have lineages, you know, unless you're a uh, vendor somewhere in the lab, you're not creating your own microorganisms out of thin air. So yes, we've worked with kefir. Uh, yes, I've worked with uh, kombuchas or, or, or even like strains of yogurt cultures from really specific places in, in like uh, Georgia in the mountains. Um, why do I think they're enduring? I think they're enduring because they work. There is um, like a co-evolutionary harmony in between microbes that have served human flourishing. And that's something really important to understand is that, yeah, if you want to go, if you want to go far, if, sorry, if you want to go fast, go on. But if you want to go far, go together. And that's exactly what microbes have done. There's all sorts of different species that have cozied up to humans over human history and proven that, hey, if we're good at keeping you alive, can you take us with us? Wheat is the most widely grown plant on earth. You know, cows outnumber humans like three to one. And even though in all those situations, it may not be fair to the animals that have been domesticated or plants, from the point of view of DNA, they're successful because they partnered up with us. And the same goes for all of the microbes, all of the, all of the genomes that are responsible for changing our food. If they are so good at keeping our food around, if they are so good at producing beer that we love to have at the end of a hard hit's work when we crack a cold one, then guess what? That yeast, those lactobacillus, will be with us far into the future because they're good at doing something that's good for us. Cool. That was all very interesting, very informative. Thank you so much, David. Um, there are more questions, but I'm afraid we, we don't have more time. Um, we'll now go to uh, Zagreb and Liliana and Vertko, who have prepared a surprise for us. Hi, Auntie. Hi, everybody in Cambridge, Copenhagen, all over the world. This seems like, you know, a Eurovision song content or something. Um, just to tell you, I am a chemist and I am interested in microorganisms as a sustainable chemical factories. So they are of huge interest to us chemists because they can produce so many wonderful chemicals in a sustainable way. But as a scientist, I also work on cell aging and drug delivery. And of course, there is interest for me in antioxidants, in all of these benefits that you can get from microorganisms in our gut. Um, and we heard now a lot about the science of microorganisms and about the fermentation as well. And we thought or that we will now take you to a practical journey. So how do we apply some of this scientific knowledge that we have and create dishes that can be also very beneficial to us. And it's my pleasure that I can sit here with one of the young, uh, youngest and well-known chefs from Croatia, Tvetko Chakota. So we are sitting in his restaurant because they are now on the break. We are not breaking any rooms because it's allowed in Croatia to have restaurants open and gatherings. We are just in between the lunch and dinner. and. Uh, I would like to introduce you to a little bit and say that what I like about his work is also his philosophy of how do you treat food? How do you treat the ingredients? And how do you make the best out of what your ingredients can give you? Tvetko is, uh, I will just introduce him before I let him speak. He's a self-taught chef. He comes, he grew up in the northern part of Croatia and um, in the 80s already, when you, Croatia was part of Yugoslavia, he was exposed through his family to Japanese cuisine. 
And so he was exposed to all of the traditional Japanese ingredients and procedures, which was unusual for that time in Yugoslavia. And it, it was almost like a space shuttle um, at that time. And this kind of uh, became a basis of his uh, cuisine as well. Later on in his 20s, he didn't think that he will become chef. He went to London and ended up working in various kitchens and collecting knowledge as he went along. He returned back in 90s to Croatia and he was working in one of the first vegan restaurants, actually the only yeah. vegan restaurant in Zagreb. And I remember reading about him at that time in the newspaper um, and, and people were saying, I am a meat eater, but I am turned into the veganism, <laughs> which is probably one of the best compliments you can get as a chef. So that means that he was working and experimenting with vegan and plant-based cuisine. He then partnered with several um, chefs and uh, um, business owners as well to lead several different uh, concepts, kitchens. And of course, all of this exper uh, experience led to the restaurant he is leading now. So he's the owner and the chef. And I will stop talking now. And I will, I said to Tvrdko, I am going to start with the hardest question at the beginning. And this is, can you tell us a little bit about your philosophy? So what is your- uh, Hi to everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's very hard to explain the uh, difference between the, the Croatia and situation here with the, with the restaurant and trying to cook uh, like, what we, are do, what we are doing now. So basically we are cooking for only 15 guests a day, uh, tasting menu, but there is no menu. So no written menu. And uh, we are completely lean on micro season, uh, which means uh, that in the day, during the day, we are getting uh, from the farm. We have uh, two sources, two main sources, two biodynamic farms. Uh, like one is uh, 40 kilometers, uh, one is a little bit further on the east of Croatia. Uh, with, uh, with information from the field, what is, what is there? So even like smallest amount, kilo, two or three kilos is going for us. Hmm. So uh, yeah. if, if I just interrupt, I was exposed to the whole philosophy <laughs> two days ago because I asked Rutko, so how do you know what is available to you. So what he does, he gets WhatsApp messages from his farmers. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, we are not like, uh, we are not the system like David was working like with a hundred people and uh, you have like a lab uh, and then you have, so we are like three guys in the kitchen. Uh, we are three guys in the kitchen, but on like hundred square meters, we have the small lab. We have uh, obviously the, the kitchen which is working for, for, for our guests, like 15 guests a day. And uh, we have the like small production of, uh, of the stuff from the top creation ingredients, organic and biodynamic, but not on the, on the big scale. We have like small scale just to show what you can do with, uh, with these ingredients. And my, because I was raised like this, uh, I always try to, to give you the food, which is gonna be good for you. It has to be tasty. It has to be, you have to feel good after you finish like uh, 12 or 14 plates, which you do like in the evening, you have to leave light and with a good feeling. So that's, that's basically one of the, the things that I'm so, so basically if I was to come here, if I get a reservation and I come here, so you will come to my table and you will tell me what you have. Or you no, will ask basically me. We just we just come to a table and we ask you. Uh, there is no system of reservation in terms of like you have to fill up uh, like it was uh, mm -hmm. in Noma because I'm I'm telling today because it's much bigger system and different. But when you come to the table, I ask you any allergies, something you don't like, something you don't prefer, and uh, basically that's it. And then we, uh, I come back to the kitchen and for every table we make the menu because we have like 25 dishes always, you know, in a kind of like, uh, so, yeah. Very and then uh, you put 15 plates for this table and very often 
between like you have six tables very often all of the six tables have different menu mm -hmm. you know? so because vegan vegetarian uh, don't eat gluten uh, don't like pork don't i mean all of the, all of these things but uh, the point is to show what we have in a real like micro season in croatia present mm -hmm. this we always said we have like 52 seasons because we are counting weeks not like uh, seasons mm -hmm. And that's it. And then mm. we start. And what is uh, for Croatia very, very unusual, and uh, because we are the nation for eating a lot of meat, basically, mm. half of the first half of the menu is almost always completely vegetarian. And then you have the the wild fish from Adriatic Sea, uh, free range meat, uh, only or, uh, only in Croatia, and then desserts. It's always the same, like schedule on the menu. Mm. But it was, uh, it was for Croatia, it's very odd mm. to have like six or seven dishes completely on veg, mm. veg side. Yeah. And, and so what was the biggest thing or, or the, maybe one of the most important things you have learned uh, from traditional Croatian cuisine? Because you spent a lot of time looking into what was eaten in Croatia before. Yeah. So what did you take from those knowledge, you know, that, those facts into your kitchen now? Uh, the, 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 Croatian, uh, uh, the Croatian cuisine, it's practically unknown in the world. When you say like Croatian cuisine, it's not existing. Mm. But uh, when I was studying the history, like 500 years back, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really like rich history because it's a small country surrounded with different influences. So you have uh, from uh, from the east, you have uh, like Turkish. Turkish. Then you have uh, Austria. Then you have the Italy. Then you have the Hungary. So the small country is like four and a half million people on five different uh, different like parts. It's completely different cuisine. Going back to the history, like in the 16th century, when it was like trade with the spices, and we had uh, we had like uh, spices that are not connected with creation, basically. Mm -hmm. This is one of the directions that we are using in a, in a kitchen mm -hmm. you know, to, to try to, to show the to creation what we have. Yes. Because we don't know that, you know, it's lost. It was like in 50 years of uh, like communism, it was lost. So yeah. we, we are not aware what we have and how rich we are, basically. So, so one of the things that surprised me as well as a lover of Asian cuisine is that Vertco gave me just to taste some things before we started the conference. And, you know, he asked me, can you guess what is in it? And I thought, I honestly thought I am eating something with a soy sauce. And, uh, but there was no soy sauce in it at all. So he is using some Croatian uh, uh, vegetables, grains, to recreate the taste of, of you know, th that are blended or blending uh, the aromas of, of the world cuisine. Um, and so we thought, because we have a limited time, we thought that we will take you to the kitchen. Um, I want to show all of the scientists who are in the kitchen, who are now uh, watching this, that you can have, you can blend the, the science and the uh, uh, cooking in, in one yeah, on, on a small scale, on because small we, scale. Have, we have to understand that uh, it's, a, it's a not big system, it's a small system. So mm -hmm. on 100 square meters, what we try to incorporate and uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday we're gonna just put uh, one small dish together uh, yesterday we had uh, the first biodynamic dinner in the history of uh, creation like modern cuisine in terms of it was a uh, biodynamic wine maker tomats which is the most uh, famous wine maker uh, in this part for us and uh, we were making menu with his uh, ingredients from his garden and his wines. So Monday, he sent us uh, the photos and uh, what is available. Tuesday, we put it, uh, the menu together and then it was the dinner. So we are not like, you know, mm -hmm. the best. The, we're just trying to, to, to show what we have okay. you know, and to use the, the, the stuff. So we're gonna show just a little bit stuff that we use for the, for, for the dinner from, uh, from his area. So I was not at a dinner, so I asked Tvertko if he can make and recreate one of the dishes that were at the dinner for me. So he prepared all of the ingredients. So we are going now to the kitchen. And while we are going, oh, and I should not really, you know, injure myself on the way in the kitchen, 
So this is how the kitchen looks like. So what we have here for all of the scientists, it's a rotational evaporator, uh, which you will know from your labs. Um, and I asked uh, Tvetko, why are you using the rotational evaporator in your kitchen? And this is basically to play with the essences it's of not, some ingredients. It's not, it's not something new. It's just, uh, you know, the, the stuff that we have in the kitchen, we are using for the essence. Also, we try to pick the best ingredient in this week and then try to elevate it a little bit more. Yeah. Not, not to complicate it, just, you know, essence, essence, essence all the time. Yeah. Okay. So, of course, uh, Tvetko has some help as well. This is Darko, who is his uh, right hand. Right part of the brain, <laughs> not right hand, right part of the brain. Because the coordination is important in kitchen as it is in the lab and the teamwork as well, as we will all um, know. So, I'll just show you a little bit what are we doing here. Auntie, we do have time for a little demo. I was ensured that this is not going to take too long. Please go ahead. It's, uh, it's just the example of the one uh, muse bush, one small bite, which was on the, on the beginning. Uh, as I said, it's connected to, uh, to, to the dinner that we had uh, yesterday. Uh, for us, uh, in, like in Denmark, that's it's normal, but for Croatia, that's, that was not normal. You know, that uh, everything that was used was better than any. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the first time. And uh, uh, I have some cool stuff from uh, which they sent me. So the barley is the mountain, like 20 kilometers from Zagreb, uh, where the wine yards are. Uh, we have the barley, uh, we have the kohlrabi, and uh, basically, yeah. <laughs> so basically. And, 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 uh, and Kasi, so uh, it's got, uh, red, uh, no, black, red, black, black, black iron. iron. Black like okay, so this is the recipe. So you need kohlrabi, you need some barley, and you have some red currant. So this is what you start, because this is what your farmer told you, this is available. Yeah, um, so from uh, basically, we always try to use everything. You know, that's, that's the normal for us. Uh, from the skin of kohlrabi, uh, we made kind of like teka. Okay, so it's... Uh, it's uh, the miso that we make. We, we are making like, uh, I don't know how many, David was probably making 100 types of miso. We are making like 15, 15 to 20 kinds. Mm -hmm. So uh, we uh, uh, mix miso with the skin of korabi. And then uh, with the one process, like 36 hours, we get the powder of this of the skin. We have just uh, simply lacto fermented uh, uh, korabi, the meat inside. And then uh, with the rest of the meat, we uh, just uh, steam it and uh, mix it with uh, fermented black currant. Okay, that's the filling. So we, uh, from, the, from the barley, which was really beautiful, we made the milk, which is going to be on the, on the bottom. And uh, when we cooked the, the barley, which was also a little bit fermented, uh, we made the porridge, which is going to be just uh, crunchy barley, which we're going to put uh, with that. Also, we have the juice of uh, korabi, which we are used in, uh, in Rotterdam. Okay, so one thing is that I said to Tvetko, korabi is one of the vegetables that I really disliked as a kid. So my mom would make lots of korabi and I would refuse to eat it. And now he's making a dish which is like everything from a kohlrabi. So I am kind of excited to see if I'm going to like that. He told me, be adventurous. I am going to be adventurous. So, so the, the, the point is we didn't, uh, about this dish, we didn't have like, uh, you know, I don't know how many days to think about it. It was like Monday, Tuesday you have to make it, Wednesday you have to serve it. It has to be, has to be good, it has to taste good. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, has to taste good. If not tasting good, <laughs> it's not good. Doesn't matter how many techniques you are using, doesn't matter what you are trying to say, if they sit, if they're not satisfied, you are done. <laughs> it's not good. And your microbiome is not happy. Okay, so we put the, the barley. 
bottom. Uh, we filled up the, the kohlrabi just, uh, just on the side. A little bit of uh, crunchy porridge. And a little bit of uh, kohlrabi juice. That's basically it. <laughs> so it's uh, it's a very simple dish, which we like just try to, to show on these two ingredients what we have in the, in the present moment. Okay? Mm. That's it. Okay, so now I'm going to try this kohlrabi dish, which I would have never eaten if my mom had given it to me. And I'm doing this for you, uh, for a live tasting at a conference. Okay. So, is there, I will ask Tvetko if there is any recommended order oh. of eating this. They're not complicated stuff. Uh, we're just trying to show uh, the philosophy behind the restaurant and uh, try to elevate uh, the, the creation ingredients, but in the way to be good for you. That's it. Basically. And I am Simple all for philosophy. it. I am all for it because, you know, one thing about the food and, and, enjoying different kinds of ingredients and tastes is also about feeling comfortable eating it. And sometimes some dishes are not comfortable to eat. And this looks very comfortable to yeah, eat. Kohlrabi is uh, asso okay. associated in Croatia almost like the food that you're going to, uh, giving to pigs. So you have to understand the normal Croatian guy who is coming to a restaurant and you're showing him kohlrabi, <laughs> that's pig food. A normal Croatian girl, yeah. too. And uh, you are trying to make uh, something that is good for you, for your, like for your well-being. And when you leave, that you're happy. That's it. Mm. You have to say it's good. <laughs> it is good. And there is a combination of crunchiness. I can I can taste kohlrabi. I can taste it. But... Um, there is something else in it as well. It's it's a different kinds of. I, I am not very good in describing this, as you can see. So it always reminds me a little bit on ice cream, and I'm a big fan of ice cream. Or I'm not supposed to say that. Mm. That's it. Mm. Mm. I will try the fermented kohlrabi with the uh, red currant sauce. Black, Black currant. Okay. Mm. which looks wonderful it has a beautiful color Liliana is it is it sweet or savory or is it both mm. oh, it's savory it's savory, savory yeah. but there are some sweet undertones yeah. which is really interesting so what I like about this dish is that you can enjoy it for a longer time and actually <laughs> Now, as we understand that also chewing is important because of our enzymes, which are present in our mouth, they need also time to work. This kind of dishes make you eat the food slower. When is it cold or hot? It is cold. It's, it's cold. cold. It's cold. Yeah. So it's, it's cold. It was like second bite on, on, on when we started. Okay. So mm. we had, uh, you know, the menu which was kohlrabi and it was carrot, it was uh, red beet and it was zucchini, so dishes like this. And then, you know, smoked carp uh, and the game from uh, the same mountain. Uh, the point is, uh, all these ingredients, if, if you show them in any kind of like restaurant that is uh, doing the, this kind of service, it would be, uh, there is not one ingredient that it's uh, like, you know, expensive or they wouldn't use it basically in Croatia for this kind of cooking. Yes. So what I shared with you just quickly is some of the footages that we got from the farm. I asked them to show us some of these ingredients. So as Tvetko said, this is 20 and 40 kilometers. There are two different places. 40 kilometers and the other one is in Slavonia, which is further away. Which is further away. So basically you take the ingredients from the farm to the kitchen as well. Um, so this is, for example, the of the cabbages 
that third cogot from the farm, I think, yeah, several it's, weeks uh, ago. It's uh, what they have, they sent. Basically, I don't, I don't uh, give them the list. Grow me this, this, and this. Basically, you know, it's a uh, one of the farms is owned by uh, by French guy, which is very interesting. And you know his mind, it's it's uh, it's different because he's speaking French way with the creation land. So that's beautiful. So, and for example, this would be the field that you will use for the barley as well. So this is us live from Nath Kitchen in Zagreb. Um, I hope we kind of, you know, showed you a little bit about this new philosophy of taking food from the farm to it's the new, kitchen. New, new for Croatia. New for so, Croatia. Yeah. Uh, of tailored menus and maybe the way the food is going to go in the future as well, where we will take into account the personalized functional foods. Um, which will be available to everybody. So if there are any questions. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, I can't stop looking at the screen and the food you prepared. I'm so jealous, but I'm glad you tried it, Liliana. Um, I can't see any questions on YouTube. Maybe we can wait for a few minutes. Rochine has one. Rochine, I, I have a question. What's on the menu tomorrow? What is on the menu tomorrow? We're gonna finish up that uh, tomorrow early in the morning. That's basically that. We have the frame, we have the frame, but you know, during the morning tomorrow, it's gonna be shaped. And how do I book a table? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to call me. Okay, I'll call. Yeah. I want to come to rushing. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I can't see any more questions. Um, Someone asks if there are photos of the food. Um, I guess you, you have social media or a website where people can find all the information yeah. and pictures. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not big on uh, on social media. I'm not big on, uh, you know, just um, kind of on the mission in this like tiny place and that's it basically. <laughs> so we have to come to Zagreb very soon. Hope so. So Ready. there's... There's a question um, either for you or for David. Um, are there any organizations out there looking to bring awareness of ferments as an alternative to food processing sterilization seen today? So I don't know if you have a, a comment on that. Organizations, um, none at like a, I, none, none that I know of off the top of my head. There's a lot of people um, at the ground level of, of like community organization that are big proponents for, uh, you know, uh, community gardens or, or uh, like community based agriculture, which incorporate uh, fermented practices into what they do. And that that is in some small way, like a, a displacement of, um, you know, lots of the processed foods that you see on grocery store shelves, if you're eating food from a farmer and working it yourself and dealing with that. Um, I don't know of any organizations off the top of my head. I would like to see that that sort of change kind of, you know, uh, spoken to power at, at like governmental levels so, though, because it's, it's, it, it's funny to say that like fermentation is the future of food and people are seeing it that way, but it's only the future because it's the past. Mm -hmm. Like it's, we're just getting back to where we started. And so, yeah, makes sense. And, and a, a question for the, the Zagreb team. Um, are you guys seeing a difference in your customers' personal food consumption in Zagreb and surroundings? I.e., are you starting a movement? Do you see that this is expanding? I, I can comment on that because I think I am observing this as an outsider, uh, not living in Croatia continuously. And I definitely think that there is a movement. Um, it has started um, and it has been, I think, also led uh, by Tvrtko. In, in a way, and there is a huge movement in terms of young people going back to the land yeah. and reclaiming the land of their grandparents. For a while, there was a huge interest in going to the cities, doing different careers, 
But what we see in the last years, I would say, is that younger generations are reclaiming this land. Um, often this is uh, untouched land because um, as we talked about Yugoslavia and living in Yugoslavia, people didn't have lots of money to invest in pesticides and in all of this kind of modern techniques of soil treatment, which it's means very clean land. it's a virgin soil. And so I think in the few years, we will have lots of these small farms, which are based on, on modern knowledge of farming. And then we see, we have friends as well that are going and studying agriculture and learning about science and then going and living in the farms and bringing this to life. So yes. Yeah, I mean, I like small example, what you can do. Also mm -hmm. hope somebody is gonna do it on the larger scale. But even with this project, you know, when we are serving such a small amount of customers, we are like, you know, there's a community of people around us, the farms, you know, it's, it's basically a lot of people on the end. So it's not like four of us. It's, uh, the it's end, like system. 40, yes. it's only like 40, 50 people connected to us. So if you have 20 like this spot, it's, it's much nicer. That's great. I, I think I, I could sit here all day, but I think we'll probably have to start wrapping up. I'll hand back over to Anthe for the final word. Thank you everyone who joined from all around the world for awesome questions. Thank you for bearing with us with all the technical difficulties. Um, hopefully we had everyone back on the live stream with interesting questions. Uh, we heard everything about microbiome in the gut and diversity, then we moved to diet and brain connection from Giles. And we heard David about fermentation and live fermentation. That was awesome. And last but not least, Liliana and Virgo gave us a brilliant show of the restaurant and this new movement in Croatian cuisine. And I guess Liliana, the food was amazing. Um, I have to say that this is recorded on YouTube and it will be available on demand on our department's uh, YouTube channel. So anyone who wants to, to join uh, can. We will try to combine the two recordings after the disruption and make one uh, available for you. Uh, there is a, someone who asked if the speakers have social media. So if anyone wants to, to share that with our uh, viewers. Yeah, I'm David underscore Zilber on Instagram. You can see all of mine. It's mostly book recommendations. It's mostly what I'm reading and what I eat for dinner. Great. Giles? Me, it's just Giles Yo. Instagram and uh, Twitter, just Giles Yo. Uh, Perfect. All together. Perfect. Liliana? Uh, well, I forgot my Twitter account, but I think Twitter is more interesting. Uh, we have it for the, for the restaurant, so it's a now restaurant. That's it. On Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Great. And Roshin? Yeah, I'm biochemist underscore hero. Don't ask. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can follow our lab too. We have a, a project on the gut brain axis, bio L, bioelectronic systems technology. I think maybe we can make this information available. A lot to remember. We can post this uh, on a comment on YouTube. Um, so that's a wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.